Okay. We continue with the exercise. Yeah, the conclusion on sub question D was that uh, it didn't make any difference here if information on this. Uh, or this knowledge of the opponent's choice of first page was known. It did not affect the Nash equilibrium, and as such, uh, the kind of value of putting a spy into the competitor's new stand was not there. Okay, uh, then let's move to server question E. Assume now that story A is slightly less revolutionary but still will return favorable sales for the newspapers if they have it alone. Okay, so now we make a change here. Um, so it's not so revolutionary that you get everything here, but you get something less, maybe something like this, 0 0.9, 0 0.1. That is one way of solving this exercise. Is it you just change the value of this one down to something below one, making it still valuable but not as valuable. Of course, you can put one 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and there's, there's a lot of options here. So maybe it would be easier to just introduce another parameter here, which I think I did in the solution, and kind of put in uh, something like this. And this beta is also a Greek letter. It's called beta. This one is called alpha, if you didn't know. So that is kind of one way of doing this, to, to simply change our matrix to kind of cope for this new situation. So by putting a parameter, you know, we can kind of simulate all kind of possible differences between these two two papers ranging from a one zero situation which was the original one and then we can let beta be smaller if you like giving getting that one bigger and so on okay so um, that is an option maybe it would be more logical to put beta here and one minus beta there but it doesn't really matter okay it doesn't really make a change uh, if you look at the solution in the textbook I assume there is something put up here. Let's have a look at it. Uh, uh, that was the first one. There was one. There you have the two sequential game trees, which both end up with A, A as the Nash equilibrium. Yeah. Of course, this must be changed, doesn't it? We should have one minus beta and beta. I think that was the idea, wasn't it? No, no. It wasn't like that, was it? Let's have a look here. We have to do this right. Mm -mm. This should be one. This should be 1 and 0, 0. Okay, now it corresponds, doesn't it? But uh, maybe it would be nicer to have beta, beta, 1 minus beta, 1 minus beta. It doesn't really matter. It seems uh, seems to be sensible. So these, these two should equal and these two should equal. Yeah. No, they do. Okay. So let's have a little look at the solution here. says here, in figure A E8, the new parameter beta defines the degree of public interest in the first page story A. Story. A beta of zero ret returns the original model. So if this one is zero, then we get one here, one here, and zero there. So then we're back to the first model we looked at. Uh, uh, the opposite way around, a uh, beta close to one would be a really boring story, suddenly. 
Hence, the information in the exercise of a slightly less revolutionary story should indicate a reasonable assumption of beta less than a half. Obviously, the relation between alpha and beta becomes important for possible Nash equilibrium. We, we see that, don't we? We have to compare alpha and beta here. So if this B story now suddenly is a little bit closer to a half, well, this then we, we can kind of get situations here where, where these Nash equilibria changes. It is left for the reader to further analyze this game and reflect on the interpretation of beta less than alpha, beta equal to alpha, or beta close to alpha. Beta equal to alpha is relatively easy to understand, isn't it? If beta equals alpha, it means that alpha is kind of the value of the A story. Beta is the value of the B story. So then they are kind of equal, equally revolutionary. Okay, If beta equals alpha, then uh, you kind of get the same same uh, uh, difference between alpha and beta. So there you're kind of a situation where this none of the stories or both stories are revolutionary. Okay, then then that is what happens. And then if uh, beta is less than alpha, which is kind of uh, the situation we started with, isn't it? But to an extreme point. If you look at uh, this one here, here you see beta is zero. Okay, and then it's very small compared to alpha. Then you get this AA as the Nash equilibrium. If you kind of increase beta now, up uh, above zero, then of course at some point something will happen here. But uh, you can't say anything general here, uh, at least not without doing a relatively complex parametric analysis, which I have not put into it. The main point here is kind of to come up with this one. Okay, so as one way of looking at it. As long as beta is less than a half, then of course this one is bigger than this because we all already have that alpha is larger than a half. And then of course there will be no change here. But it could perhaps be some changes on, on some other other uh, inequalities here. Okay. Did I miss something now? Let's see here. Mm -mm -mm. E. Yeah, there was an F, wasn't it? Maybe it wasn't. There is an F. Yeah, let's have a look at F. It's hard to go through this. Mm. Mm, yes. So now we are kind of given some answer to sub question E. How would you consider remodeling figure one for to capture this information? And of course, F is kind of what we have put on in the end here. You have to really analyze this depending on the different values of beta compared to alpha to see if you're able to kind of change these Nash equilibrium, for instance, into this one, this one, or this one. Or or more of them. Maybe we can perhaps see that, can't we? If um, mm -hmm. oh, if beta is smaller than alpha, then this one will be picked here compared to that one. And if beta is bigger enough, because this one will be picked, then we will get an Nash equilibrium down here. You kind of place the part as that one did, because then you suddenly kind of make. So so we we cannot say fully what the consequences is, is, is here, unless we kind of do a, a fairly complex analysis. So you can also, uh, to some extent, this will happen. It depends, of course, on the values and the combinations of alpha and beta. There will be, and you can force changes here. And of course, you can exemplify that by picking numbers that produces these changes that moves the Nash equilibrium from this point into any other, other possible point. Okay, that was F. Actually, this was not the right question, was it? Because to what extent would this altered situation have consequences for conclusions under question D? And question D is not question E. Question D is here. And then in that case, it's the sequential games you will have to look at to see if you can kind of 
get some value as espionage, so to speak, in that case. And, and of course you can by choosing kind of the right values for this beta compared to, to alpha. <coughs> you see that this is a zero sum game, don't you? That one plus that one. No, it's a one one sum game, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, a kind of a version of a zero sum game where every payoff adds up to one, not to zero. So it's not strictly competitive, but it it kind of resembles a zero sum game. And these games have special characteristics which we we not go into here. Okay, then we move to the final exercise, which kind of pops up here. Yeah, it starts with this uh, figure here, which uh, contains a lot of numbers. It's picked from a different textbook than the one you have access to, a fairly more advanced textbook, by the way. And uh, you see there is there is some. 4x4 four four strategic choices here and two players. Okay, so when you see this table, there's always two players. If there are three players, there will be a cube, okay? And if there are four, there will be something you can't draw. So as long as you have a two-dimensional table, it's typically two players, but you see the difference from this table to the ones we've seen so far is that there are actually four strategies for each of the players. So in this case, uh, uh, that is uh, how it is. And you see there's some names on these strategies, D, 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 A, D, D, A, A, D, A, A, A. So this is some A and Ds kind of combinations here. We will return to the meaning of that when we read the exercise. And this is the game of Russian Roulette. We discussed that uh, briefly last time, didn't we, how it works? You need this gun with a barrel. And you turn the barrel and you the first player starts and moves to the second who shoots and he keeps on until one is dead. Okay, that's... Uh, how it works. A very nasty game, not of course allowed to play in Norway, perhaps not in Russia either, I would expect, although the name is Russian Roulette. So this is normally uh, an illegal type of game to play. It says here that the strategic form game, uh, so that is kind of one way of defining this table form, in figure 1.5 contains the formulation of the game of Russian Roulette, and I assume there is a kind, some kind of explanation here. Thanks to Ken Binmore for his lowly Russian roulette mode. Okay, so there's somebody who has kind of come up with this. Uh, where one of the two players is a wimp. Uh, do you, mean, you know the meaning of wimp? Puse? Yeah, I'm not sure whether you can call anybody who doesn't want to play Russian roulette a wimp, but okay, that's the definition here. So the, the player who has the payoff above the diagonal here, which is going to these payoffs here are a wimp according to the text. <coughs> While the other is foolishly brave. Payoff below the diagonal. So there is kind of one relatively cautious player and one very kind of risk seeking player here. He loves to play Russian roulette. And then there's a, a short explanation of the game. Russian roulette is played by two players with the aid of a revolver with a six bullet barrel containing a single bullet. Before the game starts, the barrel is spun. Player one now starts by pointing the revolver to his head and fires. If he is not killed, the game continues with player two doing the same. The game ends if one of the players dies or withdraws. Uh, some of you may observe here that this is a sequential game. Can you see that? Yeah, one player starts. And then the other player observes whether he's dead, and then he makes a decision on whether to shoot or not. Okay, so this is a sequential game. Although we have chosen here not to use a game tree. Okay, this doesn't look like a game tree. So it's possible also to use this table form when we analyze sequential games. Okay, so we just to inform you about that. Although we won't kind of go into it in this course. Uh, The game ends if one of the players dies or withdraws, okay? So there's a kind of a withdrawal option here. You can kind of get out of the play. You can shoot one time and then at the next point, if it's your turn, there's only two options for the bullet to be left, okay? If there's a six uh, bullet and you, 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 if your opponent starts, no, if you start, your opponent fires, uh, you can go a few rounds, of course. At, at some point as you move around here, along here, that it will be a, a very bad odd, okay? Especially at the very last point, where is the certainty that the bullet will hit the, the guy who kind of fires. 
So there is an option to get out of the game. And it ends yeah, if one of the players dies or withdraws. Strategic choices for the players hence contain two possibilities. A, active fire, or D, withdraw. So A means that you actually pull the trigger, and D means that you kind of lay down the gun and move away. Okay. Consequently, a full game can contain a triplet like AAD. Okay. For one of the players, there are three options. Okay. There are six bullets, so there must be three points you can fire at, and then you can choose to fire in the first round, choose to fire in the second round, and then withdraw in the third, for instance. Th that, of course, is the AAD strategy. As it says, the AAD triplet hence means a player firing on the two first possibilities and withdrawing on the last. The concept of dominant strategies and dominated strategies are well known in classical game theory. The concept of a dominant strategy refers to characteristics with the best reply correspondence, implying that a player chooses the same strategy the concept of best reply correspondence is the same thing as we have called best reply function. Okay, it's kind of the same. Implying that the player chooses the same strategy, whatever the strategic choice of the opponent. A dominated strategy will, by a rational player, never be played. And in A, is rational roulette a sequential or simultaneous game? It's a sequential game. Okay, we have already answered that. B, use the technique of successively removing strategies dominated by other strategies to solve the game of figure 1-5. This is kind of a puzzle. Okay, so you have to use this technique, comparing payoffs for each of the players, going in some kind of sequence, taking out, continuing with the remaining game, taking more out, kind of and hopefully ending at something which is so small that you can actually see the solution. Okay. Uh, let's look at uh, the solution here. Mm. Yeah, this is my handwritten uh, solution, which is put on Fonter, by the way. Yeah, that's that one, yeah, and better was placed like that. Okay, mm, I should have had both uh, here. Now. The, the first, the solution says we should do is to remove the kind of law strategy. Let's have a look at it. Okay, the, the final column here. Okay, let's get rid of this one. So let's have a look and see that if that seems reasonable. Uh, uh, uh. I just need to put up another uh, one here. So hopefully I have both at the same time. Now I have both at the same time. And then we can look at uh, this one. Now, <coughs> now if you look at player twos, Payoffs, if you compare D strategy with D strategy, the AAA with the AAD strategy, you see that they have the same here. 1 is 1, 0 0.83 0 0.83, 0 0.67 is 0 0.63, but here there is a deviation. Okay, so 0 0.559 is bigger. So given that, it would be make no sense for player 2 to choose this AAA strategy compared to the AAD strategy. The AAD strategy produces successively either the same payoff or a better payoff here. So we can take that one out. Okay, then we are back with this part of the matrix. And then the solution says that we should uh, remove not this line, but the line on top here. So let's have a look at that. And remember now that this column is off, okay? And then we should compare numbers below the diagonal, because now we are kind of moved into player 1. Look on top of the diagonal, and in columns, then we look at player 2. So we kind of want to compare now player 1 and player uh, against another strategy for player 1. And if he chooses, there is 0 0.83 there, compared to 0 0.83. That's the same. 
0 0.67 is the same as 0 0.67. 0 0.50 is smaller, it's bigger than 0 0.42, meaning that this line is either the same or better than that line. So then we can take that line out. Okay, now this one is off, this one is off, we are these have these three and these two times three back. So then it seems at the point 3 here that we should get rid of is there 2 to get rid of here now? No. What, uh, then, then, uh, okay, it's this one now suddenly in the mid here. Let's have a look at that one. It's kind of clumsy doing this. So it was we should get rid of this one now, shouldn't we? And we have these three and these three. 1, 1, 0 0.83, 0 0.59, 0 0.61. Okay? These are equal, these are equal, this one is bigger. So we can take that one out. Then we have this one and these two up here remaining. Hopefully we get rid of some, some more here. And yeah. mm -mm -mm. It kind of progresses like this, okay? And you get rid of something, you end up kind of having only these two boxes left. The A, 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 D, 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 A, D, D kind of thing. And you see here that uh, then we force player two knows what player one chooses. He's this risk-seeking guy, so he always fires. And he could choose between doing nothing, withdrawing from the game completely, or actually firing at the first shot and then withdrawing. And of course, which is kind of obvious, given that he's very careful, is that he will prefer this one, because 0 0.63 is bigger than 0 0.61. And then, of course, this is the Nash equilibrium. And in this case, we found it by removing successive, successively dominated strategies, which is a different technique than uh, we did in this case. We kind of look directly for the best replies and finding the Nash equilibrium by doing that. Yeah, I think there is perhaps a more, a better visible solution in the textbook, which is not here by the way. Perhaps it's here somewhere. Let's see. Yeah, you see here, and then it's uh, uh, here, another one, then there's three, then there is one, yeah, it seems to, I'm removing two at the same time here, it seems, okay, at least it seems a little bit better than the, this other solution, okay, let's move back to the exercise itself. Continue. <coughs> Does the game contain dominant strategies? Of course, dominated and dominant are two different things. The idea is to kind of be able to separate here and Dominant strategies refers to the best reply function. So then we have to find the best reply functions to, to be able to see those. So let's have a look at the game now. Okay. Now, when we have a four strategy game, of course we have to do a little bit more of comparing here. And uh, but again, we, we, s we kind of do use the same technique. Okay, so we kind of find, find the biggest of these four numbers, the biggest of these four numbers, the biggest of these four numbers biggest of these four numbers, and similarly above the diagonal. And of course, in this case, there's 0 0.83, 0 0.83, and 0 0.83. So there should be kind of three circles around here. So bigger than 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.33, 0 0.67. Two, 67, one circle there, one circle there. 25, 33, 42, 50, a single circle there. 50 is bigger than all numbers. 25, 33, 42, 50, again, a single circle. So one cir circle there, one there two there, 
entry there that is kind of ending the best replies for player one and then we maximize in the lines here all these ones are equal so we have a square around them all of them uh, 63 is less than 83 83 83 or is it 93 83 yeah then there will be squares along this tree 67 67 squares here and finally a square there yeah and if you remember the squares and the circles now it turns out that there's only one route which has both a square and a circle which is this one then, which is the Nash equilibrium. There were some dominated strategies here, wasn't it? Dominant strategies. For instance, this one, doing the same, whatever. Okay. So there was, we could probably find more, but um, the Nash equilibrium is then easily identified. As we're asked in the next part of the exercise, I assume. Yeah, does the game contain dominant strategies? Find all Nash equilibrium in the game by the normal method. Find best reply. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at um, the solution here, hopefully it, uh, yeah, you can see it turns out like this. Actually, this is a dominant strategy. Not that. Sorry about that. This is this is on the wrong wrong set, so to speak. So, a single route with a square and a circle, producing the same solution as co of course as we found when we successively eliminated these uh, strategies dominated by other strategies. Okay, and then finally, in Norwegian, it says discuss your answers in relation to the information in the beginning about uh, Wimpy and the Brave player. Does this answer seem sensible? And of course they do, don't they? Because the kind of solution the game provides here is that there will be no play, be no game, okay? The, the, um, these Nash equilibrium points has three A's here and three D's here. So the, the second Wimpy player he kind of withdraws from the game immediately. Okay. Depending on who starts here, of course, if player one starts, then he can let player one shoot and hope that he is killed in the first shot. In that case, he would win the game and be happy. But if that doesn't happen and he has to take the gun, then he withdraws. So it could be actually one shot in the game, but it depends on who is starting. Normally that would be player one, so in that case it will be a little bit overplay here. So that seems reasonable. Okay, you should kind of expect that. Or actually you should expect that nobody would like to play Russian roulette. Okay, I don't... Uh, unless you're a suicidal candidate, you could perhaps not uh, engage in these kind of businesses. But you see, I it's possible. Although we haven't kind of looked on the behind, behind these numbers, what, how do they actually come up? Of course, we, we kind of need that to be able to... Where does these numbers come from? Okay, there is a kind of a big story behind here, which we haven't told. But uh, I just use this as an example on how to use this technique of getting rid of strategies being dominated by other strategies and then ending up in a solution where you can actually solve the game itself. Okay. Questions, comments, suggestions? There is some other exercises here related to the chapter. Let's have a small look at them. Okay, there's a one four here. Make a comparison of handball and soccer in a game theoretic perspective. The idea with this question is to kind of get the tr to to make you ref reflect on kind of what is the game theoretical difference between handball and football, and we discussed that briefly in the ex in the lecture, didn't we? That we kind of said that handball is a much easier game, much less complicated game, uh, due to the fact that you have a very small pitch and a few amounts of players, and you have the three-step rule and you have no uh, allowance of passive play, so it kind of becomes not very rich on different strategies. 
I'm not an enemy of handball. Don't misunderstand me. This is not the point here. Okay, but we're, tr we're just trying to attack these different sports objectively. Okay, and it turns out that the rules, the structures underlying handball, produces a less rich game. It's kind of poor in the sense that uh, you could say that the probability of seeing two relatively equal handball matches is much bigger than seeing two relatively e equal football matches. Kind of that, that's kind of the, the consequence here. And for those of you who have seen a lot of handball matches, and I've seen a fair amount, uh, it seems to be either two types of handball matches. Either one team is much better than the other. In that case, that team wins with ease. Or you get kind of even handball matches. They may be interesting, but it, it seems more like a lottery who wins. Okay, it, uh, there is at that stage, if one is leading by one goal and there are five minutes left, or maybe just two, or maybe even three goals, then it turns. At least if it's at a reasonable national level, then it normally ends up with being very tight, very exciting. But still, it doesn't have these kind of richness in different uh, types of games in that perspective. So that is kind of the, the point here, that if you kind of look game theoretically on this, it's kind of the, the size of the strategic space and kind of how much, what is kind of constraining these other team games compared to football. And football has a very limited set of constraints. Almost everything is allowed, unless uh, apart from these obvious things about uh, running into each other and kicking each other and beating each other, which is not allowed. Apart from that, everything is allowed. There is kind of no rules on which way you can play the ball and that kind of stuff. Okay, so The keeper is allowed to take part as a player, which is, of course, much more limited in other team sports. And then in B, can such a perspective explain differences in popularity, state reasons for your answers? And we discussed that as well, didn't we? That it can explain differences in popularity, given that uh, uncertainty of outcome which is something which those who watch it likes. Okay, so you kind of want, want to have this ability that in most of the cases the best team should win, but in certain other cases the best, the worst, the, the bad team should also win. Uh, this is kind of uh, achieved uh, somewhat naturally in football compared to other team sports where this uh, uncertainty outcome is less obvious. But we have seen other sports kind of understanding this and taking, making changes in the rules to allow for a higher uncertainty of outcome. We have also seen the opposite. The opposite is the classical example is ski jumping, where we introduce these win rules which kind of uh, makes uncertainty of outcome smaller. But the point is not to maximize uncertainty of outcome, it's to, to get the right point, okay? to balance it. Not too high, not too small. And you could perhaps predict then that the uncertainty of outcome in ski jumping was too high. In the old days it was not too high, but then something happened in ski jumping. What was that? You got a new style, didn't you? This Wii style. And that had some effects, okay? because then it opened up for a much bigger impact on wind. In the old days, when you kind of had the skis together, it was much more the force you were able to put on the spring that produced the jump. But when the Wii style came, it was possible kind of to flow through. And of course, if you have wind then, compared to not having wind, that was two different cases. You might be the world's best ski jumper, but still end at the bottom of the list. So it became extremely unjust, but still, of course, a very high uncertainty outcome. And then they had to do something. And what they did do was to change the rules. So they kind of changed the point rules and kind of gave extra points if the win were unfavorable. And they gave uh, negative points if the win were favorable, making it less, producing a less uncertainty outcome. So you might say that ski jumping were in a situation due to technological change by the invention of this new Wii style, which was criti critically kind of being uh, threatened by, uh, by wind conditions. You could have solved this problem differently, couldn't you? Any suggestions? Are you not interested in ski jumping? The season will start soon. 
indoor hill, a very good uh, suggestion, Christian. Why not? Yeah, well. What's the problem with building an inside hill? No wind. There is no wind, but you can produce wind, can't you? If that is necessary, you can put up some kind of fans at the bottom, which produces a steady wind against if that's what you like. It would be very expensive to build a kind of ski flying hill indoors, wouldn't it? Yeah, but you can build these wind screens, but they don't help because that's it's not the side wind which is the problem, it's the wind that comes against you, which produces either a good condition or a bad condition. Now the simple thing would be to forbid the V style, wouldn't it? That would be the easy thing to do. Okay, then you can jump as you did in the old days. But that doesn't seem an option. Why is that, do you think? Yeah, but you can always control the speed to make the, the jumps as long as you like. Okay, but it, it, it's far more dangerous, isn't it? I don't think it would be possible to jump 200 and what is the world record now these days? 246 and a half. It would be very dangerous to jump that with the old style. Because the speed much would have been had to be maybe 1.5 of what they actually have today when they do ski flying. So that is of course one option, one reason. But there is, there is also another reason, perhaps due to the fact, just like if you, this would be kind of like kind of like saying that it's not allowed in swimming to use crawl. The best technique is not allowed, okay? And, and that is kind of something we don't like when we are audience. We, we kind of prefer the best technique to be available. And of course, the Wii style is the best technique here, at least so far, as far as we have, as far as we know. Maybe, maybe there are new techniques coming up. I don't know. Okay. So, such a perspective, this perspective of the complexity of the game, may explain differences in popularity. Perhaps not all differences in popularity, but some of them. Okay, we, we have already argued some other reasons for popularity difference related to, to the uh, cost of doing this. You don't need too much preparation and of course this ability that unskilled persons can take part in it. And then there is this, assume that you are in a position demanding you to answer the following question. Make a set of suggestions to improve the popularity of handball, including both the rules of the game as well as other possible changeable dimensions. Do we have any creative uh, suggestions here before we stop today? I think we just stop uh, at 3 o'clock and then we call it a day for today and then we meet tomorrow for going back into the textbook and lecturing on penalty kicks. Do you have any suggestions here? I don't think it is an answer for these exercises. Making the goals larger? Making the goals larger in handball? You don't think it's enough goals in handball? You need more goals? If you make the goals larger, there will be more goals, okay? What about two keepers? The opposite way. I, I, find, I, find I think there's too much goals in handball. Okay, I think that's one of the problems, to some extent. That could be an option. Should we include it with more players then? Or should you have less players? You can, uh, you can decrease the number of players on the pitch. That would be more uh, less expensive, wouldn't it? Because then you could use existing pitches. That could be an option. And so how many players do we have in handball? Six? Seven. Seven, including the keeper. There's six out. In ice hockey there's only five, isn't it? Yeah. Plus the keeper. Yeah, so maybe you could make handball mo more like ice hockey, taking one player away. That would make a little bit more space, but the main problem with, with handball is basically the restrictions related to this three-step three three rule and, uh, and, uh, and uh, forbiddenness of passive play. What about uh, changing this three-step rule? What will happen if you take it away? Oh, and the player will take the ball, just run to the goal, and so that doesn't make much sense, does it? Yeah, of course, that's the reason why you have the rule in the first place. What about increasing it from three to four or five? What will happen then? 
the same team perhaps if there's five steps you will just be certain to get the ball close to the nine meter line on the opposite team and then one probably take it and just go in and score so it wouldn't help much so the problem here is seems to be the hands <laughs> Electroshock handball, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, maybe that is a suggestion to look for. Yeah, I'm not sure that, uh, that would be considered uh, like a sensible choice. Um. No, I really don't have any good ideas. That this is the problem, you know. When you have a sport, there is a certain structure. You can, if you if you kind of kill the basics of this structure, then it's suddenly a different thing. But definitely one thing which is important, if you want to make handball more popular, you need to be certain that the competitiveness of the leagues are better. Because in Norway, at least in Norway, female handball, the competitiveness is too bad. Okay, uh, You cannot hope for getting more audience when uh, Leibig wins all the matches. Okay, uh, Why should you go and watch Leibig win all the matches? When you're able to know that before, watch, why should you go and watch the match? Unless you're, of course, are kind of a die-hard fan. Okay, and that that could be nice to see, to see these Ludwig players making, doing what they know best. So, uh, I don't think it's very weird that Norwegian female handball actually is a popular TV sport when the big competitions comes, because then the uncertainty outcome starts to come. Okay, and maybe too to a high extent, okay, because then it's kind of more random who wins, it seems, although I may not be an expert here, uh, so I may <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to say that maybe I don't understand this game good enough, so so maybe it's not random after all. After all, we have seen that Norway has won a lot, okay, and before that Denmark, that Denmark won a lot, and, and when teams win repeatedly, then perhaps the uncertainty of outcome isn't too high any, anyway. So th there is something interesting to look at here. Okay. Yeah, it's the kind of same questions. Strategic space. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that is enough for today. So then we'll meet tomorrow, 9.15, for uh, talking about penalty kicks. Okay. <coughs>